Have you ever thought about it? I mean, really. What is the purpose to life? Why are we here? Where did we come from? For that matter, where are we going to go when this life is over? Hmm. In this seminar, it talks about the age of the earth. Dr. Hoven gives solid evidence to show that this earth is not billions of years old. In fact, the evidence points towards a literal six-day creation, like told about in Genesis chapter 1. Hi, my name is Eric, and we hope you enjoy this incredibly powerful seminar presented by Dr. Hoven. It's called The Age of the Earth. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years, and now for the last 14 years I've been an evangelist doing seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And I don't like anybody sneaking up on me, so I'm going to tell you what I believe so you know what my seminar is going to be about here. I believe the Bible is the infallible, inspired, inerrant Word of the living God. I believe it from cover to cover. I even believe the cover on mine. It says Kent Hovind. I believe that. And in case you don't know, the Bible is your basic instructions before leaving Earth. You may want to read the book because you're going to be gone for a long time. Be sure you're going to the right spot. Now, one of my jobs as a Christian is to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that's in me. And I think in the last 200 years, <clears throat> the Christians have not done a very good job of answering the atheists and skeptics. And we've allowed this evolutionary philosophy to take over our school system, our, our legal system, our whole thinking process. And it's about time we do something about it. There are three things I try to accomplish in my seminar. Number one, I want to strengthen your faith in the Word of God. Number two, if you're not saved, I'm going to try to get you converted today. Number three, if you're saved and you're not doing much for the Lord, then I'm going to try to make you uncomfortable. <laughs> Plain and simple, you know what I believe and where I'm coming from now, so that ought to make it easy. I won't sneak up on anybody. That's what I believe. Now, I need to warn you, just about every sin in the book is mentioned in my seminar series. It's likely that everybody's toes will be stepped on at least once. We recommend steel toe shoes or a willingness to move your feet. <laughs> you will need one or the other. All right, this is not my wife. That's just a picture of her. <laughs> be our 30th anniversary this summer. The first prayer I ever prayed in my life. I was about two minutes old. My mom said when I was delivered, they handed, her to, handed me to her and she counted my fingers, make sure I arrived intact, and then she folded my little hands and said, Lord, would you please supply my boy a good wife someday? And man, did he do it. Wow. Been 30 years this summer. It's been awesome. I really appreciate it. My wife, she's a piano player. And I used to play a piano in a marching band. It just hurt my back so bad, I had to give it up. Uh, but uh, I'm kidding. We have three children. Uh, we live in Pensacola, Florida. We have three kids, one of each. My kids are 24, 25, and 26, a year and two weeks apart. It's called family planning where I come from. Let's see. Son uh, Eric is an evangelist. He travels and speaks on creation. And his wife uh, works in our finance department, and they made me grandpa last uh, September 2002. And then my son Ken Andrew, sitting back there at one of the cameras, uh, he and his wife made me grandpa again about uh, four months ago. And he works in our video editing department, and she works in our bookstore. And then my other daughter, my only daughter, I found someone two years ago to take over payments on her. And uh, <laughs> she's my scheduling secretary, and her husband runs our shipping and receiving department. So we not only believe in nepotism, we practice it around our place. All six of them work in our ministry, and we're proud to have them. Now, we have in our ministry Dinosaur Adventure Land. If you ever get to Pensacola, you have to stop and see the most unusual place on planet Earth. I got sick and tired of all the museums and science centers teaching evolution. So I said, let's just do one that teaches creation. So we have a science center, hands-on activities, a museum, and an activity theme park that'll blow your mind. Everything has science lessons and spiritual lessons. We had 10,000 visitors our second year open, shooting for a whole lot more this year. We have lots of kids come through. People come from all over the world just to see our dinosaur adventure land. We want to help start these all over the country. We think God ought to get the glory for His creation. Everything we do has a science lesson. Kids learn about science, and they learn how to be closer to the Lord. That's the purpose of what we're doing here. Dinosaurs every place. Our ministry is sponsored by folks who love the Lord and love our ministry. When I started this ministry 14 years ago, I said, Lord, I'm not going to copyright my stuff. I'm not going to charge for seminars. And I'm not going to send out a letter every month begging for money. And if you don't supply, I'm going to quit. Plain and simple. <laughs> and it's been really neat. The Lord just lays it on somebody's heart and something comes in the mail and the Lord has supplied. It's been 15 years that way now almost and it's awesome seeing the Lord supply. So come on down and pay us a visit. We have a lot of homeschool science classes that we offer. We teach homeschool classes there at our Dinosaur Adventureland facilities. 
and we have stuff on all kinds of different topics. We add more all the time. God's given us about 30 just amazingly talented people to work in our ministry, and we think you'd appreciate it. If you're driving through Pensacola, be sure to stop in. <clears throat> We've sent out about 100,000 tapes a year for the last couple of years, videotapes. None of my material is copyrighted. Feel free to copy it and spread it to others. Of course, we'd prefer you get it from us, and we can use the income for our ministry, but if you want to copy it, feel free to do so. It's just been amazing watching it grow for the last 14 years from nothing to what it is today. Now, let's get started. There are four great questions that every single religion in the world tries to answer. Every religion, including atheism, which is a religion, you see, you have to believe there is no God. There's no way to know that. But every religion tries to answer these four fundamental questions of life. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going when I die? The way you answer these questions depends upon how you view the world. There are two ways to look at this world. Some people look at the world and say, you know, it's amazing. A big bang made this from nothing. That's called the humanist worldview. Other people look at the world and say, you know, there's incredible design. There must have been a designer. And that's called the creationist worldview. And those two worldviews are absolutely at war with each other. Somebody is wrong. And I enjoy showing them who they are. <laughs> I do a lot of debates. The universities have had three debates in the last nine days. Been traveling all over the country doing debates, and I've had 77 altogether now. Can't wait for my next one, but we can't find any more opponents. They don't want to defend the idea that we all came from Iraq 4.6 billion years ago, I guess, and we're running out of, running out of opponents. But the idea that uh, evolution is true, I think, is not only silly, I think it is dangerous. But if the evolution theory is true, how would you answer the four fundamental questions of life? Who am I? And what am I worth? Uh, well, if evolution is true, you are nothing important. You're just a piece of protoplasm that washed up on the beach. And you're not worth a thing. Actually, you're part of the problem because you're one of the polluters of the environment. And the more of you we can get rid of, the better. See, that's normal thinking if evolution is true. Where did I come from? Well, if evolution is true, <clears throat> we all came from a cosmic burp about 20 billion years ago. Why am I here? What's the purpose of life? Well, if evolution is true, there is no purpose, so you might as well have fun. If it feels good, do it. Where am I going when I die? Well, if evolution is true, <clears throat> we're all going to the grave and we're going to get recycled into a worm or a plant. But the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, if that's true, that puts a very different set of answers to those questions. That means we better try to figure out who God is and find out what He wants and do what He says. But boy, the devil doesn't like that. The devil came to Eve in the Garden of Eden. He said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Question mark. Did you know the first sentence out of the devil's mouth was a question to make Eve doubt God's Word? He's still doing the same thing today. He wants you to doubt God's Word. The second thing he said to the woman, he said, Ye shall not surely die. Now he's calling God a liar. The third thing he said was, Eve, if you eat off that tree, ye shall be as gods. And right there is where the whole idea of evolution got started. It didn't start with Charlie Darwin. It started with Satan in the Garden of Eden. He wants you to think you can become a god. Yes, boys and girls, we started off like an amoeba, and we're evolving. We're getting bigger and better and stronger and smarter, and someday we're going to sail around the universe and discover new life forms like Star Trek. People ask me all the time, they say, Brother Hoven, do you think there's intelligent life on other planets? I say, no. I taught high school 15 years. There's not much intelligent life on this planet. <laughs> Satan's a liar. Boy, I'll tell you what, a lot of folks have swallowed that, though. The Mormon church teaches, if you're a good Mormon, when you go to heaven, you get to be God. And if you're a good Mormon wife, when you go to heaven, you get to be eternally pregnant, producing spirit babies. My wife don't want to go. <laughs> he said, that's not heaven, honey. And by the way, there are some great books to reach Mormons. And if you want to reach Mormons, get any of these books here on the screen. I'd recommend that 100%. Uh, this good website to reach Mormons, uh, utlm.org, Utah Lighthouse Mission. If you want to get that awesome website on the ex teaching, reaching the Mormons. I was shocked to find out a couple years ago, some of the major Catholic theologians of the past have taught that man gets to become God. Now, the average Catholic doesn't believe that, and they don't, they don't even know some of their leaders have taught that. But that's official doctrine, that man can become God. The idea that man can become God came from the devil in the Garden of Eden. He's the one who wants to be God. Lucifer said, I will ascend into heaven. 
I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. You see, the devil wants to be God, but the job is not available. So he's all upset about that, and he can't be God, so he's mad at God. But he can't do anything to God, so he's mad at us, because we are made in God's image. Did you ever wonder why the devil hates you so bad? It's because you remind him of God. So he lied to Eve and told her she could become like God. Hitler said, if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it. He said they're more likely to believe a big lie than a small one. Now, if you want to get somebody to believe a lie, you have to do it like my two big brothers did with me. I have two older brothers. They've always been older than I am. But when I was about six years old, I was raised in East Peoria, Illinois, and I came running in for breakfast one morning, and I was the first one there for breakfast. And I got the last banana out of the bowl to put on my cereal. Well, a few minutes later, my two big brothers came in. They said, hey, Kim, is that the last banana? I said, yep, and I got it. How many of you have an older brother or sister? You know that wonderful feeling you get when you finally pull one over on them? <laughs> Boy, that morning I had them. I had them and I knew it. They wanted my banana. But big brothers do not beg little brothers for anything. They either beat them up and take it away by brute force, <clears throat> or they lie to them and trick them out of it somehow. So my brother said, hey, Kent, do you know how bananas are made? I said, no. I was only six years old. It's been proven in laboratory tests. The brain doesn't even start to grow until kids are 18 to 20. <laughs> how many parents can verify that one from raising kids? Yeah. I said, no, how are bananas made? And they said, we're well, down in South America. They have these spiders that live up in the trees. And when they die, all their legs fold up. And then mold begins to grow on the dead spider legs. And a banana is actually made from moldy spider legs. I said, you guys are lying to me. You just want this banana because you know it's the last one. They said, no, brother, we're not lying. You cut that thing in half and look in the middle, you can still see the black spots where his legs were. <laughs> you know, I did not eat bananas for nearly three years after that. <laughs> they lied to me. Have you ever been lied to before? You know, I would not have believed that lie if it hadn't been for those black spots. If you want to get somebody to believe a lie, you have to mix it in with some truth. That's a technique they've been using for years to sell all sorts of different products. They mix two things together that do not belong together. That's what they do to kill rats. They mix good food and rat poison together. Did you know rat poison is 99.995% good food? There's very little poison in rat poison. But the poison is what kills them, of course. They mix two things together that simply don't belong together. They do the same thing to sell cigarettes. They mix them in with cowboys. <laughs> Have you stopped and thought about that? What is the connection between smoking Marlboro and cowboys? Do all cowboys smoke Marlboro? No. Do you have to smoke Marlboro to be a cowboy? No. If you start smoking Marlboro, do you become a cowboy automatically? <laughs> no. You may smell like a horse, but you are not a cowboy. <laughs> Actually, it's been proven in laboratory tests that nobody in the world smokes. Nobody smokes. Only the cigarette smokes. The person is the sucker. That's all. <laughs> I think they ought to have some truth in advertising. They should put their real name on those things. They should call them cancerettes, breath rotters, bypass, malignant, phlegm balls, and money suckers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> truth in advertising. You know, but they do the same thing to sell beer. They try to associate beer with sports. What does beer have to do with sports? They always get some big old football player standing there holding his can of Bud Dumber. Or Bud Stupid. <laughs> you know, they call it Bud Weiser, but it don't make him any wiser, that's for sure. He's got his Bud Dumber, Miller Low Life, or Dead Dog, whatever it is. He says, man, you drink this stuff and you'll be a football player. Yeah, right. The Bible says you drink that stuff and you will wreck your life. Who hath woe? They that tarry long at the wine. How many lives have been ruined from alcohol? How many innocent lives have been ruined because somebody else was drinking and ran into them or ran over them or something? The Bible says don't even look at it when it becomes fermented. Habakkuk said, Woe to him that giveth his neighbor drink. One kid said to me one day, he said, What's the matter, Mr. Hovind? Don't you like beer? I said, I don't know. I've never tasted it. I'm 50 years old, never had a drop in my life. Well, I've had NyQuil a couple times. <laughs> and he said, Well, how do you know you won't like it if you don't try it? I said, Oh, son, that's a brilliant way to live. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever laid your head under a semi truck? <laughs> well, how do you know you won't like it if you don't try it? 
<laughs> you don't have to try everything to figure out if it's good or bad. There's other ways to learn, you know. <laughs> but this mixing of the good and the bad together,